Excellent. All right. Well, here we go. Another Tuesday, another Barton webinar. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you all, although we can't really see you unless you were to somehow share your videos and we were to allow you, but we don't, don't actually do that. So you can just sit in the comfort of your own home, walk around, you know, hold your cat, whatever you want to do, we're not going to see you. But we might be able to see what you type. So say hello in the chat. Or if you have a question for us, go ahead and put it in the Q&A section in Zoom there. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can put it in the comment section. So today is every other week, we like to just cover the basics. And that's what we're doing today, the basics of type 2 diabetes. With Dr. Scott Saunders, I'm Joe Barton with Barton Publishing. And we have Leslie Prince manning the controls here as well. And we're. Or she's uh, womaning the controls. Oh, there you is, go. There, there you we go. go. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, it's going to be a good day. So thanks for hopping on with us. And let's give a little bit of a um, housekeeping. So <clears throat> if you're joining us, you may have already been to bartonwebinar.com. That's where you can register to join this amazing webinar that we're doing right now. And on bartonwebinar.com, you can also access our YouTube channel, which has archives of all the previous the ones we've done. And we're updating that page too. We're gonna to have some frequently asked question videos that are on there to make it easy for you guys uh, so that you can get your questions answered at any time. And let's see, what else? Um, on that page, you can join our Facebook group. It's called the 610 Reset Plan. The 610 Reset, what that is, it's something Dr. Saunders likes to talk about as uh, at six o'clock at night, stop eating food so that you can have an empty stomach by 10 o'clock and go to sleep and get your um, best beauty sleep starting at 10 o'clock, activating that human growth hormone, which uh, repairs all the damage done during the day that happens to every one of us, no matter how good you've eaten or whatever, everyone's going through uh, life and stressors and toxins are affecting us all the time. So you need that good sleep. And if you get it on an empty stomach, that's the best way to get your body to repair itself. Uh, let's see, what else is on bartonwebinar.com? All of our products, including the best-selling diabetes solution kit right here. This is the printed workbook copy that you can get if you, uh, you may have already got the download version, but if you want a printed copy, you can order that on there as well. And then we have uh, our blood sugar support formula, which is called Cinechroma. This is also our bestseller. And we have some other products as well. That is, where's Nervala? I don't have Nervala by me right now, but you Nervala know, is the, You know, Joe, Joe yeah. I recommend that uh, Cinechroma uh, for most of my patients, even when they don't have diabetes, um, because it's good for the immune system. It's good for maintaining normal blood sugar and preventing uh, problems in the future because you know a lot of people are deficient in chromium and selenium those are very common deficiencies and so as a supplement vitamin d chromium selenium everybody should take them anyway uh and the yep. cinnamon is just an added measure of protection so uh, I, I, I you know even if you don't have diabetes it's a good supplement to take on a regular basis yeah it's a good point yeah my whole family takes it i recommend it to all my friends and family um i think our best customer is my pastor. He doesn't have diabetes, but he says when he takes it, his energy level is so much better. And I'm sure it's just like, I like to explain how it, it meets deficiencies of nutrients and minerals that we're not getting in our diet. So um, yeah, that's a great one. We have a, a healthy gut support product. This is a prebiotic, probiotic digestive enzyme um, that can be found on bartonwebinar.com as well. And so anyways, that's that's what you're going to find there. Uh, and we'd love to have you register. If you're not watching us live, a lot of people watch us on the YouTube replay. Just go there, register. You can get notified of, uh, of our next uh, live webinar and get your own questions answered. So um, also a little bit of housekeeping. We are looking into uh, changing the time of our weekly webinar to be Thursdays at, did we say 11 a.m. Central, I think? Um, which would be noon Eastern or 9 a.m. Pacific. And we wanna do that, we're gonna start that in January, kind of switch things up a little bit, give some new people that maybe can't join our Tuesday at noon uh, 
time slot to join us. And um, yeah, but we'll still be here. And uh, Dr. Saunders, if you want to take us away, talk. Let's let's start with the the disclaimer that we always like to do, and then let's get into let's give them the whole kitchen sink, shall we? <laughs> Literally. Okay. So. First of all, the information that we're giving on here is general information that may not apply to everybody. So you take the information, you take it to your doctor, advisor, or your healthcare provider, and you say, okay, I heard about this, and is that appropriate for me? Is that the right thing for me? Um, and then together you can work on, you know, why or why not kind of thing. Uh, and so... Don't just assume that because it's said here that, that oh, you know, I, that I should be doing that or I need to do that. Um, make sure it applies to you first. That's, that's number one. Uh, number two, today, we're going back to basics. So we're, we're going to discuss the basics of what is diabetes in the first place. <clears throat> we often um, get mixed up because there are so many words, diabetes, that mean so many different things. And even sugar diabetes, when your blood sugar is high, can be very different for a person who doesn't make insulin in their pancreas compared to a person who makes too much in insulin in their pancreas. So the uh, diabetes type 1 is a problem of not enough. So let, let's use the kitchen sink analogy. Um, the, uh, the water won't turn on. The faucet... Uh, there, there's just not enough insulin there. And so the sugar can't get into the cells, so you don't have enough energy. Not enough energy, not enough insulin. Uh, the blood sugar goes up because that sugar can't get into your cells. So the cells don't have any energy and they are starving to death in a sea of sugar. Isn't that weird? They're like, they're like covered in high levels of sugar and they can't get enough and they're starving. And that's what people, before they knew about insulin, people died of diabetes and they died of starvation, um, no matter how much they ate. So type one diabetes is not enough, so you have to add in what's missing. It makes perfect sense, right? So, um, but type two diabetes is exactly the opposite. It is too much. You have to think toxicity. So if I had, too much lead in my body, what would I do? Well, no, two things. Number one, I would stop eating lead wherever I'm getting it. If I'm, if I'm chewing on the windowsills with the old paint on them, the leaded paint or, um, or, or my pencils. When I was little, I used to like eat pencils. I, I chew on them. Uh, I don't know if they had leaded paint, but you know, I tested, I didn't have any lead. Ah, you're um, fine, Dr. Saunders. <laughs> it's just, my brain doesn't work. Um, so uh, I, I would stop taking in lead, but number two, I would get rid of what's already there. So you have those two ways of detoxifying. Uh, in, in the same sense, sugar is, uh, or diabetes type two is too much. So type, type one is not enough, type one is too much. So now you have this overload of sugar. What are you gonna do? Well, the exact same two things, you're gonna stop taking it in and, um, and you're gonna use up what you have there or get rid of what you have there. So one of the ways to look at this is the kitchen sink analogy. If you look at uh, kitchen sink and the water's on and, uh, and you turn the water on, you walk away uh, and you come back and it's overflowing because the sink is clogged. You didn't know it was clogged, but the sink is clogged. So you got too much water in there and it's filling up, it's filling up, it's overflowing. And it starts to overflow and you go, oh my gosh, the floor is getting all wet. I got to clean up the floor. So you start mopping the floor. And, um, and, and that's just like when you, when you have diabetes and it's spilling over into your, your blood and your blood sugar is going up because you have just too much sugar and the cells can't take in anymore. Um, then what happens? Well, you go to your doctor and the doctor says, well, you got to start mopping up that sugar, you know? So they give you a drug. What does the drug do? Well, it, it cleans up the, the sugar in your blood, uh, but then it keeps spilling in. So you keep cleaning more. And then, so you go back to the doctor and say, this isn't working. He goes, ah, you need two drugs. So then you take a second drug. Now you got two mops going at the same time. Uh, and, and, uh, and it's still spilling over. The sink is still spilling over onto the floor. Uh, so, so he goes, I'm going to give you the big guns. I'm going to give you insulin injections. So you go to the doctor, you get insulin injections. 
And that's like those big mops, those big ones that'll take up a whole bunch of water. So you're mopping up that and, uh, and it's keeping the floor sort of clean and it's sort of drying out, but the, it's, still, it's still spilling over from the sink. Um, what's your other option? Um, what's, the, what's the obvious thing to do? Well, just walk over to the sink and shut off the water, right? And if you shut off the water, are you gonna need those mops? No, no, no need for mops. You just shut off the water. It's not gonna spill over anymore. That's exactly the way you should look at your diabetes. Shut off the water. So if you look at the diabetes reversal uh, kit, diabetes solution kit on Barton webinar, um, it, the, the phase one is such a simple uh, program. It is shut off the water. So, uh, and what are you shutting off? The sugar. It's the sugar that's spilling over into your blood. So you're shutting that down. Uh, and you're not taking in any more sugar. So you're not filling up the sink anymore. So it's not spilling over into your blood. So do you need drugs? <clears throat> do you need metformin? Do you need uh, gliburide or glipizide or uh, any of the other medications that are prescribed or insulin injections? Are you gonna need insulin injections if you shut off the water? No, no, just be unnecessary. Why mop up the floor if it's the floor is still dry? So. That's, that's the key to type two diabetes is understanding that you're toxic on sugar and you have to detoxify and you detoxify by shutting off the water, uh, shutting off the, um, uh, the, what's overflowing into your blood. Um, the way we do it, uh, and, and that's not the only way, but we had to think of a way, what is going to work for a large number of people? What is going to generally be useful for this kind of diabetes? And, uh, and what we, the best thing we came to was a very low carbohydrate diet. So phase one is a specifically outlined, it's a program and it's pretty easy to follow. <clears throat> and uh, all you do is just do what it says. You eat 20 grams of carbohydrate or less and so you're using that 20 grams isn't what is way less than you would you normally use in a day. Um, so, you know, like, like the, the sink is draining just a little bit and your water's dripping just a little bit. And well, you're okay with that. It's never going to overflow at that level. Um, but the other thing is that while you're doing that, because you're not taking in extra, any extra sugar, um, you're using up all of the excess that you've built up in your cell. So it, over, it, you know, sometimes 10 years, 20 years, people are building up to the overflowing. And, uh, and, and if you stop the flow, then it'll go backwards and it'll go, go down. So the sink, the level will go down of the water or the sugar in your cells will go down um, so that you no longer have that uh, risk of overflowing. You no longer have the diabetes problem. So does that mean you never have diabetes again and you can eat anything you want? No, you can fill them up again the same way you can you know, fill up that clogged sink again. Um, you have to look at it like, um, where do you go then from there? Well, we have a phase two program in the diabetes solution kit where you're no longer on this tightly restricted, uh, you know, little teeny, teeny flow. You can start, getting the ebb and flow of, of a normal or more regular or more normal diet. Um, but uh, during that time, everybody's different. So some people have, uh, their, their, their clog isn't a complete clog, it's, the, it's letting a little bit of water through. So they, uh, uh, they're allowed a little more than, than other people, other people you know, maybe they don't make enough insulin or maybe they're really insulin resistant or, you know, there, maybe there's a genetic problem and they just don't tolerate carbohydrates. So those people will stay on a very low carbohydrate diet for a longer period of time, probably for the rest of their lives. So phase two is the individualization of it. It's, it's how, how is this working for me? And then phase three is the lifestyle. That is from now on, this is what I am, this is what I do, because I found, uh, I've found, I've drained the sink and I found what works for me, what my level is, and now I know what to do for the rest of my life. So there's the, those three phases. 
And that's how our program works. It's really simple. It's very basic. Um, and if, if you have type 1 diabetes, and remember type 1 diabetes, you don't have enough insulin. So you probably have to inject insulin. But you can have both type 2 and type 1 at the same time, type 1, type 2. If uh, a lot of people with type 1 diabetes, they inject more insulin and their doctors even tell them, yeah, eat whatever you want and just inject yourself with more insulin. But what's happening? You become more insulin resistant. And one of the reasons for that is because when people with type 1 diabetes inject insulin, um, they can start making antibodies against that insulin because it's not their normal insulin that they're, that they're uh, making from their own pancreas. It's insulin that's uh, different. Uh, so uh, if they make antibodies against the insulin, then they're going to become a little more resistant to it as well. <clears throat> then they can have type one and type two at the same time. So to prevent that, they could still do the same program. They can, they can go on the very low carbohydrate diet, inject smaller amounts of insulin, or they will need smaller amounts of insulin. They won't get resistant to it. And then they, uh, they can do phase two pretty quickly because they control their insulin. Uh, and then, then their lifestyle would be a little different than somebody with type 2 diabetes, but still it will help them to not require so much insulin. You, you know, there's another issue with too much insulin, and that is insulin is the only hormone that tells your body to hold on to fat. So if you don't have insulin, you can't gain weight. I had somebody uh, in my office, my, uh, she's uh, almost 90 years old, and uh, her daughter brought her in and said, Mom won't gain weight. And I'm like, why not? Well, she eats and eats and eats. She eats like crazy and she just can't gain weight. And so we, we, uh, we tested all her met metabolism and everything. Turns out she makes a very tiny amount of insulin. She makes insulin, but just not very much. And so she can't gain weight because the, the insulin is what tells your fat cells, hey, store this. this is, there's, a, there's an extra food here, store this fat. Um, and if you don't have insulin, you can't. So if you think about those people that, that gain weight no matter what, they say, gosh, I am eating nothing and I gain weight. What the heck? And, and my roommates, um, they eat like crazy and they don't gain weight. Why? Why, you know, why am I gaining weight? It's hormones. You know, it's, it's not always just what you eat. You have to deal with your hormones the way they are. And so if you have high insulin levels naturally, then you are naturally going to gain weight very easily uh, and hold on to it very, very much. So it'll be, it'll come on easily and it won't go away very easily. So those kind of people, you have to shut off the insulin periodically and that's fasting. So you can do intermittent fasting or a couple of days of fasting, three days, or some people, I've had people do cleanses for long periods of time, like 30 days uh, where they're just drinking like broth or water. Um, and, uh, and that works really well too. So periodically shutting off your insulin, if you have that kind of a body type that you make ex excess insulin and hold on to fat really easily, um, you can't do it with, with dieting because every time you eat, you make more insulin. Then you eat again, you make more insulin. So all those, um, diet, um, diet, dietitians and, uh, um, uh, I was going to say, uh, diabetic counselors, but yeah, dietitians. Um, and they tell you, you should be eating five small meals a day with snacks in between so you never have an empty stomach, so you never get hypoglycemia. That is the worst advice you could possibly give to a human being. It is, because the only time we repair, the only time we um, reverse the diabetes and all the damage that's done from the catabolic metabolism is when we're not eating when the stomach's empty. You want an empty stomach. In fact, you want an empty stomach as much as possible because the more you have an empty stomach, the more repair you do and the more sensitive you are to your insulin and the less insulin you need so you don't put on as much weight as easily. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. I, you know, the, the hardest part for me is I've been trying to implement that 610 reset and not eating is like, man, it's the willpower, it, it fades or the, the self-control at the end of the day to not eat at that time. Um, it's, I know, it's I not have easy. that same problem. It's not easy. 
yeah. I, I, you know, I deal with that too. I, I try the six ten reset every night, and I make it maybe five days a week, four days a week, and and uh, the other times it's like, okay, I'm really hungry, I'm gonna go eat something. <laughs> yeah, that's way better than me. But I mean, it's simple. Like the concept is simple, but actually yeah. doing it is is not uh, easy. Yeah. And so it takes it takes some work. But like if you if you have a big enough reason why or big enough pain points, like that's probably all the reason you need and that will give you that willpower to say no, especially as you start to experience the benefits of that quickly, because it it does make a drastic difference. So yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, you mentioned some great stuff with the kitchen sink analogy. I love that. It's such a good picture of what's going on in our bodies and too much sugar and all that. And I think one thing that the diabetes solution kit is uh, also helpful with it. First, it tells us, okay, only 20 grams of carbs, but then it clarifies like, okay, what foods are actually um, like how much carbs are in, in these foods and what foods are good, which foods are not, which to avoid as well. Because sometimes there's foods out there that you have no idea that they have carbohydrates in them. And maybe uh, potatoes might be an example where, yeah, there's no like sugar in potatoes, but it's a starch and it is actually high in carbohydrates and it converts to sugar quickly. So maybe you could talk about that as well. And and like you talked about bread earlier before we went live today, things like that. Yeah. Um, so what's nice, if you have uh, an understanding or if you have an understanding of what a carbohydrate is, and uh, Joe, that's a really good point because uh, there are things that are pure carbohydrate or almost pure carbohydrate, like broccoli, for example, um, that are very low glycemic index and have almost no sugar in them at all and almost no starch. Well, what is all that carbohydrate then? Fiber. Fiber is stuff that we don't digest. We don't absorb. We don't make it into sugar. Um, it goes into the large intestine and it feeds the good bacteria in our intestine. It's really good for those. Uh, good bacteria. It, um, of course, broccoli has a lot of protein as well. Uh, but, um, but if you look at just the total carbohydrates, you might think, oh my gosh, I can't eat broccoli. Uh, gosh, there's nothing left on my list. All I can have is meat, a carnivore diet or something. Um, but no, that's not the issue. Um, looking at net carbs is really important. So you take the fiber out. Uh, so if you look up broccoli, fresh broccoli, for example, and, and it says, you know, it's uh, 100 grams of uh, carbohydrates, uh, but 80 of those are fiber. So you only have 20 uh, grams and well, that, that would be a uh, very high for one serving of that would be very high. Like um, anyway, <laughs> so yeah. So the point is the the net carbs are what's important. And that's where, you know, when you go into the book and you find uh, how to find out what the net carbs are, uh, and then and then lists of foods that tell you, okay, these have very low net carbs. These are giving you like one carb per serving and two carb per serving, stuff like that. Um, even though their their total carbohydrate is high, um, and the other side is is what Joe was talking about: things that you don't expect to be high in carbohydrates uh, that uh, that actually are. Um, uh, potatoes, of course, being one of them. Any root vegetables, the roots like beets. Um, I had someone who was drinking beet juice and was wondering why his blood sugar was going up like crazy. And I'm like, it's the beet juice. The, stop the beet juice. Uh, he says, but it's good for me. Yes, it's good for you, but it's not good for diabetes. So, uh, so you know, he had to, to cut that out. Uh, so some things that you may not expect uh, to have uh, sugar in them are made into sugar, even though they're totally natural and really good for you and full of vitamins and, you know, and, and, and whatever, whatever, but still, um, you know, it's an interesting thing though, carrots. Uh, carrots are actually pretty high in carbohydrates and they, they have starch in them, but raw carrots are very low glycemic and have very few carbohydrates. So I was surprised to see in the book that um, you can have quite a lot of carrots in a day and before you meet your uh, 20 gram uh, carbohydrate. But once the carrots are cooked, uh, then a lot of that fiber is broken down into starch and so it becomes digestible. Uh, and, so, and so now your carrots are more starchy. So actually 
raw carrots, um, I don't really have a lot of carbs. So that's where the book is helpful. It's telling you um, where you're going to see the carbohydrates, where they're coming from, so that you can you can make that determination of okay, what is a 20 gram carbohydrate diet? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I had a question. You talked about broccoli, and it reminded me of something um, I've heard in the past that you know when your body um, you know is hungry or whatever. Is it craving like substance as far as like, you know, matter or is, or is it, is it craving like the nutrients from the food? And then, which is why maybe if you're eating, you know, bread or pasta or some of these other carbs, like you're not really getting much for nutrients, but if you eat like a salad with a lot of vegetables, raw vegetables and things like that, you're getting nutrients that your body wants. And then it's like your cravings go down. Is that, is that accurate? Um, to some extent, yes, especially with minerals. Uh, um, we crave foods when we're missing minerals, and uh, it's called pica. And it's very common with an iron deficiency. People with iron deficiency, they start eating inedible things. You know, they say, oh, wow, this dirt smells really good. I remember my little brother, uh, when he was young, he would be eating dirt, literally, like he would pick up handfuls of dirt and eat it. He would just have it mud smeared all over his face. And, and my mom would be like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> Eating dirt. He goes, it tastes good. It's, uh, it smells really good. Um, it doesn't taste like it smells, apparently. That's what he said. I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it's called pica, eating inedible things. Like me with my pencils, chewing on my pencils uh, when I was a kid. That's pica. Some people, uh, like they like to chew on ice. Uh, even though ice is edible, technically that that's often pica as well, but you have to just, you have to crunch on something. Um, and that craving can come from a mineral deficiency and it's, it's not that uncommon. But there are other things like when your blood sugar starts dropping low, you start craving carbohydrates. I need bread. Uh, oh, that cake looks really good. Ooh, a potato sounds really good to me right now. And, and that's because the blood sugar is dropping. Uh, and that often happens with a lot of stress. People, when they, when they get stressed, they don't start reaching for celery sticks. You know, they want sugar. They want something sweet. They want, you know, only like juice is gonna satisfy that, that sweet craving. Um, and, and that's because the stress hormone, like uh, cortisol, the main one, uh, causes you to be resistant to insulin. And so because you're resistant to insulin, it causes a craving, a carbohydrate craving. I need carbs. It's as if your blood sugar was dropping low, even though it's not. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Well, I was thinking too, the other thing with hormones is like, yeah, if you're stressed out and you eat, then you get like endorphins going and things like that, like kind of the pleasure, pain, pleasure experience as well, right? So it kind of like makes you forget about the stress in your life. Yeah, yeah, endorphins are wonderful. And, and endorphins are released with exercise, excellent thing to do, uh, and, uh, and, and fasting. Uh, exercise and fasting are the best ways. Uh, fasting does, it partially releases endorphins, but mostly makes you more sensitive to the endorphins you have. It makes you more sensitive to everything. Fasting is so good for you. I, I can't even tell you how good it is. Having an empty stomach is, uh, I think, and uh, not just me, but anybody who's done research on it says, if you want to prevent aging, if you want to cure any illness, just fast. That's all you got to do. I had a guy, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story. So, and this is, this is recent. So this guy comes into me and he said, okay, I can't walk from here to the door 10 feet away uh, without getting chest pain. I, I mean, like I have to stop and take <laughs> heavy breaths and, and my chest like feels like an elephant sitting on my chest. And then I can walk another 10 feet and I have to do the same thing again. So I went into my cardiologist and he said, if you don't have surgery and do bypass surgery on your heart, you're going to be dead easily in a month. Uh, there's just, you know, you're so blocked up. Uh, so, and the, the number is uh, the calcium score of the arteries he had was um, uh, normal is up to hundred. Ideal is zero up to hundred is considered okay of calcium in the arteries. He had 1,200. So uh, he was, you know, so far up there. So his cardiologist is like, you know, you're not going to survive this if you don't like get a bypass and, and fix this. 
And, and so he came into me after all of that went on and he goes, okay, I do not want to bypass. Uh, I just, I don't, I don't want to do the surgery because I know the surgery destroys the brain and I need my brain. Um, so he says, what, what I want to do is a fast and nobody will help me. And I've heard you will help me. So uh, that's what I want to do. And I'm like, okay, deal. So I helped him, uh, whatever. I gave him advice, you know, advice is cheap. He had to do it. So he drank only water for one month, 30 days, water only. In the middle of that, at, at about day 14, he got dizzy one time and fell down and hit his uh, forehead on the piano and had to get stitches in his forehead. And, and the doctor in the ER is saying, you are an idiot. Do not do this. This is really, really bad for you. Look, look, see that hole in your head? <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, I don't want heart surgery. And he goes, actually, I'm feeling better. It was only two weeks, so he kept going. And so after 30 days, he was playing a full game of tennis, a full tennis match. He was a tennis pro. That was his job. And he's playing a full game of tennis, zero chest pain, wow. no problems at all. Uh, and he continues to this day uh, to have. And, and that was fasting. That's what he did. Yeah, that's awesome. Wa water only for 30 days. Yeah. Fixed his heart. Very cool. Awesome. Great. Love to hear the stories. Um, you know, we've had a lot of good questions coming in here, a lot of compliments as well. So I think, why don't we turn things over to Leslie here and Leslie connect us with our customers and their questions. And let's, uh, let's finish out our hour here doing that. All right. Sounds good. Um, a very kind comment from Patrick came in just thanking us for doing these webinars. So we appreciate you too, Patrick. You've been uh, one of our loyal webinar viewers. So it's been fun to have you back. And I know you've had a lot of success with this program too. So thank you for being here. Um, this question comes up a lot. And actually, Joe didn't mention this, but we are going to start including some of our top questions on our Barton webinar page so that as some of these questions come up, we can just direct you right there, which is gonna be really nice. But let's address this one more time really quick. Why do artificial, artificial sweeteners affect weight loss, even if calorie oh. and carbs are greatly restricted? Okay, okay. This is huge. Uh, and the research has been done, this is not new. This is way back in the 1970s with saccharin before, before uh, stevia and all these other uh, aspartame and all these other ones were available. Um, so artificial sweeteners have an effect on the receptors for sweet. And because they stimulate sweet receptors, they tell the pancreas, oh, there's a whole bunch of sugar there. Um, release a bunch of insulin. And so uh, in the 1970s, when Pepsi did research on um, the sugar Pepsi versus the diet Pepsi. <clears throat> the people who drank the diet Pepsi gained more weight than the people drinking the sugar Pepsi. And they go, that doesn't make any sense. These guys are eating fewer calories and they're gaining more weight. These guys are eating more calories and gaining less weight. What the heck? That doesn't make any sense at all. Oh, well, we'll just throw it out the window and forget about it. And so it was never published. Um, uh, in a in a, a major journal, um, and then um, since then, multiple studies have been done. Other studies have been done on comparing, um, like especially sodas, this the, uh, of uh, people who drink uh, diet sodas uh, have a, a higher body mass index than people who drink sugar sodas uh, at the same level that they drink. So that you know. Uh, three sodas a day versus three sodas a day. Uh, the people with the diet sodas uh, tend to gain weight more. So why is that? What the heck? Uh, remember, I just told you, insulin is what tells your body to put on weight. Insulin puts fat on. It's insulin. It's not the calories. Remember the, the, the one person with the high insulin eating a very low calorie diet is still gaining weight while all their roommates with, with low insulin, eating a whole bunch of sugar and carbs and everything are, are losing weight. And, uh, and they're, they're going like, they're, you know, pulling their hair out, getting all upset because, you know, it's not fair <laughs> kind of thing, but it's really about the insulin. So if you have a tendency to diabetes, then you likely diabetes type two, then you likely make excessive amounts of insulin and you probably 
uh, put out more insulin with the sweet taste than people who don't uh, have a, a tendency to diabetes. So if you have a tendency to diabetes, I do not recommend any sweeteners, even stevia, even hidden ones. So sometimes it'll be like a gravy. And this is like a really salty gravy, right? And they don't tell you that they put sugar in it or artificial sweeteners in it. Um, but they do, and very often. So you have to be careful with sauces, especially. Uh, but uh, seasonings, like you, you get some barbecue seasonings, you know, it's a really salty seasoning. And uh, Lowry seasoned salt, for example. And they put a bunch of sugar in it. And you don't know you're getting all that sugar. But your taste buds in your, in your intestines know, and you release extra insulin anyway. And so you still put on weight and you go, what the heck, I'm doing everything right. So be careful of artificial sweeteners that they can destroy your whole diet and everything. Okay, good information. Uh, let's see, Gregory has a question. I'm at a 5.6 uh, via A1C now at home test kit using Synechroma. I have a doctor appointment Thursday for a lab test. Can I ask my doctor to reduce or eliminate my 100 milligram twice a day metformin and glipizide? A thousand milligram twice a day metformin and glipizide. Yeah, absolutely. You should get off glipizide. Yeah. So tell them, tell them first of all. Okay. So 5.6 is uh, normal, by the way. That's it's non diabetic. So you don't have diabetes by definition. Um, so there should be no problem with your doctor saying, yeah, get off the glipizide because glipizide can cause hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. Um, whereas uh, metformin won't tend to do that, won't cause low blood sugar. It'll tend to make you burn fat more. Um, so uh, yeah, but, but with, with the first one to get off of would be the glipizide. And then if the doctor says, gee, you're in the non-diabetic range, uh, you probably don't need this at all, uh, then you, you may not need either one of them. Hey, just yeah. a quick kudos to Gregory. I mean, that's a pretty awesome job right there. Getting yeah. out 5.6. Way to go, man. That's awesome. That's the goal of the program. So it says he did that using Synechroma. So a shameless plug. Synechroma, <laughs> this is the blood sugar support formula that Dr. Saunders uh, formulated. It's got vitamin D3 and vitamin K2, which I think we'll get to in one of these questions coming up here that talks about calcium. Uh, chromium, picolinate, selenium, vanadium, and cinnamon bark extract. So you can get that on uh, bartonwebinar.com. And if you enter a coupon code when you check out webinar25, you'll save 25% off the already discounted price. So there you go. All right. Next question. <laughs> right. Uh, this is from Luann. I've been following your program for three months now. For the past month, I'm experiencing headaches every day. Is it because I'm detoxing? Ah, okay. Um, there are so many reasons for headaches. There's probably as many reasons for headaches as people who have headaches. Um, so, uh, so I, I can't answer that question, but it could be what, what detox, like the sugar detox, like I was talking about when you shut off the, the water um, and the sink is no longer overflowing. Um, if your body is used to this level of sugar, um, then you have um, insulin receptors uh, of, uh, at, at that level. And so when you start dropping your sugar down, um, then you get relative hypoglycemia. Now it's not actual hypoglycemia because if you measure the blood sugar, it's perfectly fine. But your ability to get, get that sugar into, especially the brain, uh, is going to be limited because you've dropped the, the sugar in the blood so, and now there's just a trickle going into the brain. So you could get hypoglycemic types of, uh, of reaction and, and low blood sugar. Um, the, the way to handle that uh, is to uh, push through it and continue on the program. And I don't know, take an aspirin or a Tylenol. And uh, because what, because you actually need the hypoglycemia, we discussed this in a previous webinar. You need the hypoglycemia so you can start making those insulin um, or those uh, glucose transport proteins to get more sugar uh, into your brain with lower blood sugar. So you, you actually need that to happen. It's okay. I don't know if that's why, but that's possible. Okay, great question from Krish. Welcome back. 
thanks for the kitchen sink analogy that you have told us, is type two a digestive order? Some state that it is. True or false? Disorder. Um, yeah. 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 Oh. A, a, digestive, a digestive disorder, um, in a sense, yes, but it's, it, that's only a portion of it. Um, it's really a global disorder. So uh, it can be a digestive disorder in many different ways if you're just absorbing uh, carbohydrates and not getting the right nutrients, uh, poor, poor nutrition because you're not uh, digesting or absorbing food well, yes, that can be an issue. Just not getting enough magnesium, we discussed in, in one of our webinars, uh, can cause diabetes. Not getting enough chromium or vanadium can cause diabetes. So in a sense, it could be a digestive disorder, um, but uh, it becomes a global disorder because it's it's a metabolic problem. So it affects your brain, it affects your nervous system, and definitely affects your intestinal system and your ability to digest and absorb food. A uh, fun note here from Tina. Thank you for this. I love this information on carbs. I've stayed away from sugar and I've now lost 15 pounds. That is awesome. Congratulations, Tina. Okay, Pamela is wondering, will a high fiber will a, a high fiber food offset one with more sugar in a meal? Um, the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> but can I qualify the yes? Um, so um, fiber, one of the things that it does is it slows the absorption of sugar. So instead of having a rapid absor absorption of sugar, like let's say watermelon, let's say you have watermelon. Watermelon is like, uh, has a higher glycemic index than ice cream. And so, but, but people say, oh, watermelon, that's a fruit and it's natural and it's good for you, right? And it's okay. Uh, so let's say you eat some watermelon and it's just like your sugar goes boom and shoots way up. If you were to have that watermelon with something really high in fiber, like uh, broccoli, right? So, uh, oh, that sounds good. Broccoli and watermelon. No, it doesn't sound good. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and what the broccoli will do then is slow the absorption. So instead of having a spike like that, it'll go, ooh, and then it'll, it'll, you'll still absorb the sugar, but it will be a little more gradual. So yes, it does prevent spikes in sugar to have that extra fiber. So if you're eating a potato and then you have a bunch of like raw broccoli or a good salad with, with some potato, that will slow the absorption of that starch or sugar in the potato. Um, uh, yeah, but the, the qualification is remember that on phase one of the program, it's total amount of carbs. So 20 grams a day, um, yeah. Okay. Sandra said she has struggled for weeks with this issue and I found exactly what you are saying to be true. It's very difficult to lose weight when you are on insulin, but using this low carb diet, you do reduce your carbs and you will eventually reduce your insulin requirements. And it's a miracle you start to lose weight. So Woo! thank you for that, Sandra. That's awesome. That's really cool. All right, let's see here. Give me one second. All right. I was just diagnosed. This is from Marv. I was just diagnosed with type two diabetes. My doctor wants me on metformin ASAP. I don't like drugs and I bought the Synechroma and the solution kit. What are your thoughts about starting on metformin and then adding Synechroma as well? Okay. You can, if you want to, but remember metformin is a, it's a toxin. Uh, it, uh, it blocks your ability to, um, make or use sugar and, and increases the cyclic AMP so that you start burning fat. It's kind of tricks your body and your mitochondria into burning fat instead of sugar. Um, so uh, so it, it has some benefits, um, but it is a toxin. And if you don't feel comfortable with it, remember it's your body. And so if you've just been diagnosed with, uh, with type two, and, and you're ready to do the diabetes solution kit and start with the Synechroma, um, I would do that. And, uh, and, 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 you know, talk to your doctor about it and say, I'm really more comfortable with this. Can we test this for three months? And if it comes back with the hemoglobin A1C, you know, higher then I'll go on the metformin. You know, that kind of a, a trade usually works pretty well. All right, that's good. 
All right, question from Gary. Can the Diabetes Solutions food plan reduce calcium in the heart? My cardiologist had me do a calcium scan and the score came back around 400. He wants to put me on the statins, but I want to try diet. What do you think? And uh, also, can the ingredients in Nervala help to reduce heart calcium? I'm also a type two diabetic with an A1C score of six. Okay. All right. Good, good, good questions. Okay. The answer is reducing heart calcium is not as easy as we think. You know, um, even that guy that, um, that I told you that did 30 days of fasting, 30 days water only, and was able to play tennis uh, by the end of the 30 days from not being able to walk across the room without crushing chest pain to playing tennis with no chest pain in only 30 days. Um, uh, we retested him a year later uh, with no chest pain, no heart issues at all. Everything looks really good on the outside, all of his symptoms. We retested his coronary calcium score and it was 1300. It was even higher than it was when he had first tested before he did the, the fast. I don't know. Um, uh, the, the, the calcium score is really a, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, it's kind of metaphorical. It's kind of like, a, oh, this is how much inflammation is going on in your arteries uh, of your heart. Um, and so even when it comes down, it seems like the calcium just hangs around there. I don't know. But I've seen several cases uh, similar where uh, another person with chest pain, a heart disease, got um, chelation therapy to take the calcium out. And after the chelation therapy he says, yeah, I feel a lot better. I'm walking and no, no more chest pain or anything. Um, but we redid his coronary calcium score and it was the same. It hadn't changed at all. So your questions are really good. Can these things lower coronary calcium? Probably not. Um, however, uh, they may help you function better without necessarily lowering the coronary calcium. Okay, we have a question here on Facebook from Davina. Does skipping dinner help lower blood sugar? Oh, Davina, that was Davina. Um, okay, yes, skipping dinner is, is a great thing to do because <clears throat> when, uh, when research is done on people who skip dinner, do uh, intermittent fasting, it's called, where they only have like a five or six hour window of eating, and that's that. They, they eat during those five or six hours. The rest of the day, they eat nothing. So they're fasting the entire time, the rest of the day. Um, if they are fasting by skipping breakfast and they just eat like lunch and dinner, um, they don't do as well as the ones that eat breakfast and lunch and skip dinner. Skipping dinner is great. It's a really good way. In fact, they, um, Sachin Panda that did the research on the circadian rhythm, uh, he looked at that specifically and he says, if you stop eating at six o'clock, uh, that's really good. So you have an empty stomach when you go to bed and you get your, your anabolic metabolism at night and all of that. But if you stop at three o'clock, you actually lose weight and improve your scores. Uh, so things improve. So great question. Yes, absolutely. Skipping dinner is a great idea. Yeah, hey, I just thought of a great business idea based on that question. What if we came up with a meal delivery program for people that are fasting dinner and we just send them empty boxes? And it's like, <laughs> but it's, I don't yeah. think we'll probably do that. <laughs> but it would be effective. Well, our, our dinner came in tonight. What do we got? Nothing again. <laughs> Same it's as last nice night. It's a nice box, though. <laughs> uh, all right. In the fireplace. <laughs> okay let's see what other questions do we have here all right i haven't read through this so i'm gonna okay here we go what do you recommend for high thyroid um uh, i recommend finding out why you have high thyroid um this is important because if it's an autoimmune um disease or or process then it's a, a different problem than if it's not, than if you're high thyroid for whatever other reason, you have a hot nodule or a cancer or something like that. So the first thing when you have high thyroid is you wanna know why. 
Um, don't start with any treatment or anything. Just go, why? Why do I have high thyroid? Okay. Did we get Eddie's uh, water question? Um, the top one. Oh, yep, yep, yep. Okay, it's a good question. This has come up before too. In the 610 reset, can you drink water between 6 and 10? Um, uh, yeah, yes, you can. Water, water empties out of the stomach pretty quickly. Um, but you got to remember when you go to bed, you want to have an empty stomach, ideally. So uh, I don't know. I, I've had people like drink a quart of water right before they go to bed. I don't know how fast that empties. Um, apparently in the, in the studies, it empties pretty quickly out of the stomach. So I don't know that it's a big deal. But yes, um, because the stomach empties according to calories and water has no calories and it, it empties quickly, then water is generally okay. And that's kind of the other thing that you talk about too. It, it's not necessarily stop eating at six o'clock. That's, that's depending on what you eat. Like if you ate, you know, a pizza or a heavy meal at six o'clock, it's not going to be out of your stomach by 10. So, uh, right. Yeah. If you eat a whole bunch, like, like pizza is a good example because pizza is pure calories. It's carbohydrates, protein, fat. That's all it is. And so, um, if you ate like a half a pizza and drank a pint of beer, you know, at, at six o'clock at night, you know, um, after midnight, it's still going to be in your stomach because it just takes a long time to empty all those calories out. Whereas if at six o'clock you have a, a small salad with vinegar and oil dressing, um, you're, uh, that's going to empty out pretty quickly. And so you're clearly going to have an empty stomach by 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the saying, it's like, eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen or a prince, and dinner like a pauper, basically, like, if you're, yeah, have your biggest meals early in the day, and then really just taper off. Yep. Yep, yep that seems to work. That seems to be the best. Mm -hmm. All right, we got a lot more questions. We'll keep rolling here. Okay, just confirming, this is from Glenn. <clears throat> so the 20 grams is net carbs which is correct. That is net carbs. Um, and then uh, let's see, Terry is asking, is glipizide and glyburide the same medicine? Um, they essentially work the same, but they are different. Uh, they are, they, they're sulfonylureas and they trick the pancreas into make, making extra insulin. So they tell your pancreas to put out extra insulin um, which causes your blood sugar to go down. Well, that's fine. But remember, your problem is not that your blood sugar is high. That's just what's spilling out in, onto the floor, uh, out of your sink. Um, the, uh, the, your problem is this excessive amount of insulin. So, uh, so mopping up that uh, extra water on the floor, um, yes, it will, it will dry out the floor temporarily, but, uh, but if the sink is still spilling over, either one of those two, they're essentially, um, they're very similar, essentially the same, but they're different. Uh, they're different chemicals. Okay, uh, Johanna is asking if you know anything about Munique, M-U-N-I-Q. No, I don't know okay. anything about that. Is that a brand name? <laughs> I don't know, actually. I didn't look it up, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I should okay. uh, Donna, regarding fasting, I wanna fast, but I thought that fasting would allow my blood sugar to drop too low. How can I fast and keep my blood sugar at a normal level? Also, is this 610 protocol, does it just pertain to four hours between eating and going to bed at night? Yeah, um, so the 610 protocol, um, yes, it's that primarily, but then the other part of it is to eat breakfast in the morning. So having two meals a day would be uh, breakfast in the morning and then lunch and then a, a small dinner or a skipping dinner like we talked about. Um, okay, well, I'm sorry, what was the other, the first part? Um, fasting, uh, just being afraid oh, that the blood sugar will drop too low. Yeah, um, yes, your bl blood sugar will tend to drop uh, pretty low. Uh, and if you're really insulin resistant, that, that could cause hypoglycemia and you probably will get symptoms from that. Uh, so one of the things that people do in order to avoid that is to start slow, like you do um, a 12 hour fast, and then you go up to 13 hours and 14 hours. So you're moving your dinner back, you know, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Or, 
or uh, I don't know, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And then you move it back to seven, then to six, then to five. And you're just um, going back. You can do it one day at a time or a good one week at a time and move it back until you only have one meal a day. And by the time you have one meal a day, you're not going to have a problem with hypoglycemia. You can go for 10 days uh, and, and you'll be fine. Yeah, I, I did a quick search of that Munique, and it looks like it's a meal replacement shake that talks about uh, people with diabetes as well. But looking at the nutrition label, it's got six grams of fat and 42 grams of carbs, 15 grams of protein. So uh, there are 15 grams of fiber, but to me, that sounds like it's still pretty high in carbs and probably want to avoid that. Yeah, so it sounds like one of those shakes, you would already be over your 20 grams. It does say net carbs are seven grams. I don't know if that takes the fiber away from the carbs as well. And if it also uh, uses the protein, maybe, I don't know. So maybe, I don't know. I'm not sure how they're coming yeah. up with seven net carbs, but. Yeah. Huh. Well, I looked up broccoli and uh, <laughs> So broccoli, in one cup of broccoli, there's only 3.5 net carbs. There you go. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too, like other foods that you would think are like higher in carbs that, that aren't, like cheese. Like you could put cheese on your broccoli, which makes it, I think, tastes 100 times better. But there's really like no carbs in most cheese, right? Yeah. 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 Cheese, cheese isn't high carb. Yeah. So that's, that's a good food, typically. Speaking of carbs. Pamela is asking, I can lose weight easier if I have higher carb food in limited amounts as opposed to a huge salad. Why would that be? Um, oh, that's really interesting. Um, amounts have a lot to do with how much insulin is released. So um, yeah, that is really interesting how uh, sometimes, and I've had cases of this, of people who just eat too much. And so, you know, if, if they were to go on the diabetes uh, uh, solution kit and just do the phase one and they go, okay, I'm only gonna eat 20 grams of carbohydrates, uh, but they have, you know, huge amounts like broccoli with a whole bunch of cheese and, uh, you know, uh, adding a bunch of meat to it. Um, they can get uh, uh, um, higher blood sugars and more insulin resistance on that diet, even though they're lower in carbs. Yes, yeah, smaller meals is actually better. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Okay, we are almost out of time. Joe, do you have any other of these questions that you wanna answer? Um, well, this, this is an interesting one. The last one in the Q&A from the UK, if you want to read that, well, I'll, I'll read it. So uh, <laughs> this person had diabetes diagnosed since 2007, doesn't take any drugs. Um, low, they're on a low carb diet, takes cinnamon, chromium, berberine and other herbs. Uh, A1C is 6.0. I'm, I'm 65 years old. I've weighed 60, uh, 52 kilograms since I was 17 years old. Uh, I'd should like to gain weight, but can't. And you kind of talked about this earlier with insulin. So my doctor says I have asymptomatic hyperglycemia. Uh, I have not heard that before. Hyperglycemia, so it's like asymptomatic high sugar. Um, yeah. Fasting doesn't help me. I just lose weight. And if I don't watch my diet, my blood sugar can go up quite quickly from around six or seven to around 10. It always comes down by itself over a few hours. If I take any drugs, I get hypo. Any thoughts or advice? Okay, so it sounds like you probably have a, a, a pancreas problem. So the pancreas is not putting out insulin properly or well. Uh, so it, it's probably not a primary like excessive insulin. So the first thing you would want to do is to test your insulin levels uh, and your C-peptide levels. Uh, we talked about that in one of the other webinars. Um, testing those two things gives you the this insulin is the immediate what is it right now because it changes from minute to minute. Um, the C peptide gives you more of a, 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 a broader spectrum of how how much the pancreas is putting out because if everything you eat causes your blood sugar to go up, then uh, then it's it, your pancreas probably isn't putting out the insulin when you eat properly. 
Yeah, I think that was the webinar that we called like five things that your doctor might not tell you or something like that. Leslie, yeah. what episode right. number that was? It's like 56 maybe. Um, and that, right. was, you remember that, that was, well, we just it looked just at it this thing. morning. So it was, yeah, because you mentioned the insulin test as well as the C-peptide test in that as one yeah. of the five um, myths or things that they don't talk about. So that would be a good one to go back and watch. Yeah, and and if and uh, and if you want to really know, then do the um, the the three hour glucose tolerance test with insulin. So you do the glucose tolerance where you you take um, twenty grams of, uh, of of sugar like like syrup, and then uh, and then you you follow your what your blood sugar is doing, but also look at the insulin to see how your pancreas responds with insulin. So both of those give you a really good idea of how what your insulin response is. Excellent. Well, hey, man, we got through a lot of questions today. This was awesome. Covered some good stuff. And uh, thanks, everybody, for participating. Hope that you found it helpful and valuable. And we hope to see you on future webinars as well. And if you uh, are looking to watch more uh, of these uh, that we have on, on our YouTube channel, just go to bartonwebinar.com. We have the links there. Uh, be sure to subscribe as well on YouTube. Love to have uh, you do that. Subscribe, hit the bell. You'll be notified of new videos that we put out. And again, if you wanted to get any of the supplements that we have for sale, use that coupon code and save an additional 25% off. The coupon is called uh, Webinar25, and that'll save you some, some extra money as well. Um, a lot of these supplements, like, you know, you're not a big proponent of supplements per se, but you're a proponent of making sure people are not deficient in key minerals and nutrients. So I think that's, I think people can tell that you're like an honest doctor. You're not trying to like make money on how many supplements we can sell. Um, I mean, it helps, you know, helps our business for sure. But you, I, I think people can really get a, a, tell, uh, a sense that we truly want to help people. That's one of our core values. And Dr. Saunders, thank you so much for uh, being an awesome doctor that really helps us. You show up every week and you're a rare person. Just want to thank you for that. And a lot of people Thanks. have expressed that uh, as well. So close us out with uh, parting words here. Um, okay. So as far as the supplements go, um, I don't think anybody should need supplements, but for heaven's sakes, sometimes we do. And, uh, and I measure people's levels and I find out that that, that, there, that uh, chromium is a very common deficiency, selenium is a very common deficiency, um, and these help you to use the sugar. Uh, magnesium is a very common deficiency. Um, uh, and, and so if uh, you uh, need supplements, then it's important to take them because uh, deficiency diseases were the most common diseases, uh, well, infectious diseases, deficiency diseases, were all that doctors dealt with before we discovered vitamins and discovered uh, supplements and the ability to take extra uh, vitamins. We don't see those now because people take supplements if they're not getting uh, adequate amounts in their food. So it is worth it. Yep, all right. Well, this is great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Saunders. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Hope you have a great day, a great rest of your week, and we'll see you next Tuesday. All right. God bless. Take care. Bye-bye.